Hello and uh, welcome to episode 49 of History with James and uh, today we're going to talk about Alexis de Tocqueville. We call this one the Alexis de Tocqueville Great French Mind. Before we get in there I'd like to talk about a few things. One of them is we're, we have a fundraising effort on iTunes. So you know if you feel like the 49 episodes we're providing here are where you know like you feel like supporting us even more you know through uh, you know, because like I said, it's nine dollars for bandwidth a month. Um, you know, it's just a way to say, show your appreciation. If you type in, let me see if this works. I haven't tried it yet. Um, if you type in James Gray G R A Y into iTunes, okay. Let's see if this works. Should be searching, but if you type in James Gray, G R A Y, and then you go to the album section once you search it, um, it should be you should be able to go through and then find it just by going to the albums of the or under James Gray. Once you type in James Gray, um, let's see if I can find it here. Hmm. Oh, okay, it should be under yeah albums, and then it's Coolidge for a, a metaphor for contradiction. It's nine ninety nine, and I don't get all the proceeds from this of the nine ninety nine purchase, but essentially it has, um, you know, it's the, the episode for uh, Coolidge a metaphor for contradiction on it, and I know we've done the episode already, and it's not exactly new content. But uh, it is the most popular episode, and I think of it a way as fundraising to help us out here with some of the costs associated um, with the podcast. Um, you know, that's just another way you can help. Again, so James Gray, search James Gray on iTunes, um, G R A Y. Or if you searched um, Coolidge and Metaphor for Contradiction in Google, it's available on more than one marketplace. And that's just a way to help out the podcast. Uh, another way. Uh, the ad revenue from our YouTube channel hasn't really been generating a lot, and I'm thinking of just putting full episodes up on YouTube. Uh, and we did have exclusive content for the um, YouTube channel. Um, I haven't really been keeping up with it because it's a lot more effort, but um, I'm thinking of just putting full episodes up on to um, the iTunes, I mean, um, the YouTube channel. And both of the links are contained within the description of the show if you'd like to find them. Anyway, so do the introduction here. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville was um, born in the aftermath of the French Revolution in 1805. Um, Tocqueville came from a French noble family, and most of his family was executed during the Reign of Terror. Again, it is important we define the Reign of Terror, so we never should assume that somebody knows something that's listening to the podcast. We should always just do our best to describe um, what it invented or what a term is. Okay. Describing the Reign of Terror, Encyclopedia Britannica stated, caught up in, in civil war and foreign war, revolutionary, uh, revolutionary government decided to make terror the order of the day, September 5th decree, um, and, and to make harsh uh, measures against those uh, suspected of being enemies of the revolution, nobles, priests, um, Noble's Feast, and I think it's Monarch? Let me see. Uh, hoarders. Sorry, I have no idea why that's one of the categories. So Noble's Priest, Hoarders. In Paris, a wave of executions followed. <clears throat> As we have already pointed out in the episode about the French Revolution, <clears throat> some of the leaders of the French Committee of Public Safety, the chief power in France and institutor of the measure, were executed as well. So this was a um, anarchical, anarchical um, measure here. It even took the people that had um, put it in place in the first place. Um, and you can learn more about the French Revolution in our episode, French Revolution. Um, let me go to our podcast section on my iPad here, and I'll just try to do that. Um, there is an episode... Let's see, I'm just looking for it right now. 
Ah, French Revolution and Radicals. That's an episode we go into detail about the French Revolution. And it will help you to frame this episode. We try to connect as many of our episodes together as possible as far as like, hey, um, we did an episode on this. Um, there's a little, you know, we have some information on this podcast, right, that relates to this other topic. And you can go back and listen to it if you want to um, listen to it. And again, we always try to keep the content under an hour an episode. Okay? So we pointed out, uh, right, that even the people that were responsible for these um, measures were executed. The reign, of terror, uh, the reign of terror was so destructive, it did not stop till the leader of the Committee of Public Safety was executed. Committee member and former lawyer Robespierre was executed in 1794, the last of its victims. While, this, while his parents were not executed, the Tocqueville's parents were in prison. And, and I think and something I read, it talks about how de Tocqueville's father's hair, um, you know, he was in his 20s, his hair went white from um, the stress of being in prison. The experience of the events of, the, of his family and his own dealing with revolutionary France greatly uh, shaped him. Um, de Tocqueville att uh, attended... College at uh, Metz, that's northern France, or north, um, I think northeastern France, close to the um, border with Belgium, I believe. Tocqueville attended college at Metz before studying uh, law in Paris. While in Paris, Tocqueville met um, fellow lawyer Gustave de Beaumont. Um, Journey to America. In 1830, de Tocqueville and Beaumont uh, received authority to carry out a study of the American prison system. And why is this important? Because um, I really didn't think I was going to talk about this, but I go ahead and, I'll go ahead and go into it. Um, the American prison system was studied by the world because it, it, it actually was not... Most people um, that were in prison in Europe stayed in prison for the remainder of their life and died. They had debtors' prisons and these types of things where um, whole classes of people um, were put in prison for the rest of their life. And prison um, populations in Britain got so overcrowded, they started sending um, prisoners to what is today Australia. There were um, prisoners sent to places like Georgia and so forth and so on as a way to relieve some of the pressure of all these prisoners and lower class people they had. They couldn't uh, support themselves. Okay? So in 18, and in America, this, there's a difference. Uh, people actually got, could, get out, out, could, get, um, could get out of prison. And the... Um, in, um, in European countries at the time, you could not get out of prison. In 1831, they set sail for Rhode Island. In describing their journey, History.com wrote, From Sing Song Prison to the Michigan Woods, from New Orleans to the White House, Tocqueville and Beaumont traveled for nine months by steamboat, by stagecoach, on horseback and in canoes, visiting American penitentiaries, and quite a bit in between. In Pennsylvania, to Tocqueville spent... A week interviewing quite a, a bit, bit in between. In Washington, D.C., he called on President Andrew Jackson during visiting hours and exchanged pleasant, pleasantries. By the time Belmont and Tocqueville returned to France in 1832, they had traveled much of the United States. So it's roughly about a nine-month journey they, they have in America. Two objects. Uh, the, the objective to study America's prisons was a success in the report titled on the penitentiary system in the United States and its application in France. Yet Alexis de Tocqueville had more in mind to, from his journeys. As About.com sociology section would write, and we'll get what you know, about, um, About.com is a very reputable alternative to sites like um, Wikipedia and, the, and types like this. Usually there's some kind of expert. Um, the sociology page I used did not have what we would call expert opinion from what I could tell, but it did um, cite the references it used, um, including the Blackwell Dictionary of Sociology, um, Biography.com, about Alexis de Tocqueville, and um, so there, there were references, what they were writing about in particular, and so, you know, so those are some good things that we'd like to see, you know, reputable um, citing of sources. Um, okay, right, as about.com sociology section would write, they also hope to uh, return to France with knowledge of a society that would make them fit to help shape France's political future. 
It was in this mind that Alexis de Tocqueville started to work on his work, Democracy in America. The work is History.com described, and History.com is a wing of the History Channel, again another reputable source, revealed de Tocqueville believed that equality was the great political and social ideal of his heir. Um, and he thought that the United States um, offered the most advanced example of equality in action. Um, Democracy in America, a two-volume work, was written between 1835 and 1840. Also provides a look at America like no other. With that said, let us look at the um, look at a few of the items contained in Democracy in America. And this is where it actually goes into detail about the work of Democracy in America itself. It took me quite a bit of reading to get to the answers that I was looking for. And some of the material was mixed up, so I had to staple it in order, but I may be reading some of it out of order. Part of the reason de Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America was because he believed the French model uh, tried with, within his parents' lifetime was flawed. Again, turning to the introductory chapter. So this is where he starts at. The framing of the democracy in America starts with the French example that he's, you know, he's experienced in his own lifetime. Again, turning to his introductory chapter, we see a critical writing on the government in France. I perceive that we have destroyed those independent beings which were able to cope with tyranny single-handed. But it is the government that has inherited the privileges of which families, corporations, and, individu and individuals have been deprived. In the mind of the Tocqueville, the aristocracy of France prevented tyranny of the king and served some purpose to the new democracy. Yet now the government was unchecked and assumed the powers in France. So um, the nobles and the aristocracy in France had, um, in his mind, prevented tyranny of the king in a certain sense, so that, that the one man was not the lone man in power. Um, and in a certain sense here, we also know that while they took away the power, they also started to become very destructive of the people and the old things. Tocqueville um, surmised that France had gotten rid of the advantage of the old state, but reaped no rewards. His, he he uh, articulated this by writing, We have then abandoned whatever advantages the old state of things afforded without receiving any compensation from our present condition. The new state was, as de Tocqueville described, a radical fervent revolution under the guise of a better society. So um, de Tocqueville points to how they treated the um, nobles and the aris aristocrats. And... A lot of it he was pointing to was a destructive in measure, right? So it got rid of the old advantages of the old state, which were a lot of things for a lot of people, but it didn't reward, you know, um, receiving um, without receiving any compensation for the present condition. So it simply tore down the aristocracy, getting rid of the you know the aristocracy of France, who um, de Tocqueville believed had an advantage to the new state, without really rewarding anybody um, of the lower orders with anything other than the government taking control of the, um, um, the aristocracy's previous uh, advantages. So that's what he's writing about here. The new state was, as de Tocqueville described, a radical fervent revolution under the guise of a better society. So it's a, ra you know, a fervent revolution, radical. Um, expanding on this thought, he noted the destructiveness of the French democracy. The democracy of France unchecked in its course or abandoned to its lawless passions, has overthrown whatever crossed its path and has shaken all that has not destroyed. So again, it's not really a free society. It's a destructive society in which the revolution destroys and if it doesn't destroy something, it, uh, it makes people afraid of it or unable to, um, to really um, call to action against it, right? There's really no... There's, there's no really no other way. It's uh, hey, we're gonna we destroy these people, and if we left you here, well, you better not do anything, right? The democracy of France had turned to tyranny, according to the author of Democracy in America, writing, "Its empire on society has not been gradually introduced, or peaceably established, but it has 
um, constantly advanced in the midst of disorder and the agitation of a conflict. In the heat of the struggle, each partisan is hurried beyond the limits of his opinions by the opinions and excesses of his opponents until he loses sight of the end of his exertions and holds a language which um, disguises his real sentiments or of secret instincts. So, summing that up, the democracy of France had become a destructive force, ruining what, what, what is in its path. The destructive manner, uh, the destructive manner of that society, and the hurried, uh, the destructive manner of that society, and the hurried nature of it became, according to um, the French aristocrat, an empire of society, uh, where people became um, actors not of their true ideology, but rhetoric which kept them safe. So again, you notice at the end of this quote here, he says, until he loses sight of the ends of his exertions, okay? So he loses sight of where he's going and holds a language which got, disguises his real sentiments uh, or secret instincts. So things he's trying to hide from the other people because um, these opinions are not safe in this society. Um, we also, you know, we talk about, uh, he talks about, again, a uh, empire of society, so an empire on society, um, you know, a uniformity of society, a uniform way of thinking, a uniform way of acting. Um, also, too, I'm trying to think, well, there was one more thing that I didn't want to talk about. Oh, it's also, it's done quickly, and it's not done gradually, it's done really fastly, which doesn't give any time for the people to think about it, right? People are loose sight of the end of their exertions, and uh, their opinion, their, what they really think doesn't really matter so much because it's hurried and it's quick, okay? So that's another thing he's sort of talking about. Um, in the hurried, okay, we talked about that. The um, de Tocqueville, along with um, the prime innovation, oh, sorry. The Tocqueville, along with British statesman Edmund Burke, became the most critical of the French Revolution. The prime motivation for his visit to America was to see how the American had established an effective democracy. So that's what really frames what he's looking at here. Um, throughout, this, um, throughout this book, he starts from the French Revolution. He talks about where he thinks the um, French have gone wrong, you know, the persecution of aristocrats, um, the empire of ideals, these things that he brings up, um, getting rid of oh, the getting rid of something just be, get rid of, getting rid of something just because it's old and was part of the old state, um, not really thinking, um, you know, not taking the time to think. Well, is that something that we can use in in our new society? Instead, a, a fast, um, fast moving. Um, I'll go back to what he said. I'm trying to remember. Um, let's see here. It's an empire on society has not been gradually introduced, right? So not, not established in a slow manner, in a clear thinking way, or um, peaceably established, um, sort of when people are wrapped up in the um, guise of war, right? They're in the middle of war, so they don't have time to really think. You know, they're not really calm and collected in their own peace of mind. Um, in the midst of disorder, the agitation of a conflict. So not something really sat down and thought about, okay? That's what he gets about here. Um, in the opening chapter, de Tocqueville talks about the geography of the United States and, the, and makes the observation that unlike most nations, the United States has a start point to observe. Okay, so the United States doesn't have all these other complex things to take into account. The United States has the arrival of European settlers um, and the establishment of a brand new um, society in that sense. They don't have thousands of years of uh, animosities with their neighbors. They don't have all these types of things that exist, right? In a certain sense, the Tocqueville points out the crowning achievement of American society. All the British colonies had then a great degree of similarity at, at the epoch of their settlement. All of them, from the, from the first beginning, seemed um, destined to witness the growth of not of the aristocratic liberty of their mother country. Again, so not the growth of the aristocratic liberty, meaning a, uh, in England you had a class of people that were uh, truly free, um, these aristocrats, these people that you know were established, but of that freedom of the middle and lower orders 
of which the history of the world has a yet furnished no complete example. And that's why he comes to America. He believes America is so much different from the European orders because, again, uh, it doesn't have the baggage of these other societies, right? These animosities. It doesn't have, um, it has a start point which to begin society and which to begin democracy and, you know, these types of things. Yet the Tocqueville points to two distinct Americas, one of the North and one of the South. The South, as the Frenchman saw it, was less moral for its practice of slavery. He wrote in, the chap in Chapter 2 of The Origins of the Anglo-Americans, Part 1 of the Democracy in America. So, okay, again, Chapter 2, Origins of the Anglo-Americans, Part 1 of the Democracy in, in America. Slavery, as we shall afterwards show, dishonors labor. It introduces idleness into society, and with idleness, ignorance, and pride, luxury, and distress, and inviterates the powers of the mind, and benumbs the activity of man. The influence of slavery, united to the English character, explains the manners and the social condition of the southern states. So even de Tocqueville notes, and this is important because we see this growing divide between North and South, in, in a way of how the North is separated culturally from the South. And this is important because it leads into what eventually will be the Civil War. In the North, uh, slavery by this time had pretty much gone away. In the South, it was still a very much established part of the culture inside the South. Okay? And uh, the curious Frenchman denounced slavery as an institution of the South, but still had an overall favorable view of, the, of America. Okay? Um, he recognized that it was just 15... Um, I don't know if he really recognized this, but he did have a generally still overview, uh, a generally good overview of the United States. Um, and, and part of that would have probably been, because maybe to Tocqueville, this is a bit, a maybe, I don't know from directly reading this, but um, what we know today is that only 15% of um, whites within the South owned slaves. Uh, uh, and he was right about his observation about slavery, because um, slavery, as we shall afterwards show, dishonors labor, it introduces idleness into society, with idleness, ignorance, and pride, and luxury. So a lot of the people that were in this society did not have these same educational opportunities. Wealth was really much, very much concentrated in this 15% of the planters class in the South. Um, and there were a lot of poor whites that worked, um, lived in pretty deplorable conditions, um, even among today's poor. Um, the, a lot of the education probably, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who live in the backwoods that didn't have the education. Um, and, um, you know, so the things that he observes about, you know, what, what, what slavery brings, you know, dishonors labor and uses idleness into society. And uh, with idleness, ignorance and pride, luxury, right, there's luxury and distress. So it's sort of like um, by having a class of people that work for free, how is it, um, you know, it's not by their choice, it's the planner, the planner class that created this, um, but it, does, it um, kind of cheapens the labor of the rest of the people too, okay? So, but he still had an overall uh, favorable view of the United States. His inter inter in his introductory chapter, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville noted that uh, why he wanted to sh um, study American society, because he said... Uh, nothing struck me more forcibly than the general equality of conditions. Um, this is, um, yeah, so nothing struck him more than um, the equality of conditions. Now, this is different. Equality of conditions is different from just equality in general. He makes a clear distinction between revolutionary France, egalite, uh, liberté, and uh, fraternité. And these are the three values of the, um, the French Revolution equality, fraternity, and uh, liberty. Um, he doesn't. He draws a line between um, equality of condition and equality, um, and he thinks America is a, is a you know is equality of conditions, but not equality in everything in society. Okay, so that's what he he's really looking for. He seems to think that, like I said, in his French, the beginning of the, he spends a long time on France. He seems to think that France um, has created a society where um, equality has become destructive. So he's looking for a different kind of equality. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find where I was at. 
in his uh, writings here. Um, and then he talks about aristocrats in America. While, uh, he, he wanted to look at it because um, de Tocqueville was an aristocrat. And for him, it probably concerned him. Um, uh, you know, what was the future of an aristocrat in this new world of political equality and stuff? See, remember, he talked about, in the introduction, we talked about how de Tocqueville thought of equality to be the um, big um, change in society that was coming, right? And he wanted to make sure people of his ilk would not be killed. Like, while France killed its aristocrats in the reign of terror, America succeeded in democracy and took no action against its uh, landed gentry. So if you study early America, you notice there's a, a lot of people that are landowners in places like Virginia and Maryland who come to shape the early history of the United States, who put in place principles that for, the, um, for everybody to succeed. And these are people like Thomas Jefferson, um, George Washington, um, James Madison, George Mason, um, trying to think of some other people. Um, Yeah, there's a lot of these people there in, 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 in Virginia who become a big part of the fabric of the United States. Um, he, and he points to this. He says, instead, America fostered its aristocrats to be a part of the society. And as Tocqueville wrote, democracy flourished. Upon his travel in 1831, he wrote, in America, the aristocratic element has always been feeble from its birth. And if at the present day it is not actually destroyed... It is at any rate so completely disabled that he can scarcely assign to it any degree of influence in the course of affairs. The democratic principle, of, uh, on the contrary, has gained so much strength by time, by events, and by legislation as to have become not only predominant but all-powerful. There is no family or corporation uh, or corporate authority, and it is rare to find even the influence of individual character, um, and it is, and it is, sorry, and it is rare to find even the influence of individual character in, uh, enjoy um, and durability. Individual character enjoy and durability. Okay. Um, even with the presence of aristocrats, America had a great environment for the populace. Expanding further, de Tocqueville wrote, men are, men are there seen on a greater equality in point of fortune and intellect, or in the other words, more equal in their strength than in any other country of the world, or in any age of, the, of which history has preserved the remembrance. So let me um, talk a little bit about... Um, how the Founding Fathers saw America. They wanted to see, they believed that in order for their society to flourish, virtue needed to be common to all people. Because without virtue, people were liable, uh, liable to, um, yeah. So basically, uh, they were to, um, you know, they had to be virtuous um, because then people, if they weren't virtuous, then a society could fall into tyranny. So a big part of the United States um, was education, and a lot of people, um, they worked towards making people virtuous in their society. Okay? Men could move, so like, like he points out there, you know, um, men are there seen on a greater equality in point of fortune and intellect, or in other, world, in a, um, in other words, more equal in their strength. Okay? Men could move in and out of society to a much higher degree than Europe. The Tocqueville must have wondered what the fortune of France held for people of his background. Change was coming not only to France, but the rest of Europe. I think we pointed this out earlier in the introduction. You know, change was coming to Europe. It was this political ideal of equality and political equality. As we have discussed, Germany was in the beginnings of a reform within Within, uh, within its state, within its own state. So in about the 1840s, there's reforms in Prussia, there's reforms across the German states going on, which we talked about in, um, let's see, what was the episode? I could pull it up here and see if we can. Um, let's see, I believe it was the last episode. So Germany splintered to United. You'll notice talk, we're talking about a, as the United Germany station um, 
nation comes to be born in the 1870s, we see an increasing amount of um, political liberty for the people. Okay. Um, right. So Britain. Uh, so um, as we have discussed, Germany was in the beginnings of a reform within its own states. Britain, with perhaps one of the strongest democracies in Europe, soon uh, would would um, soon land even greater rights of the people. In France, the destructiveness of the people um, targeted uh, people of aristocratic backgrounds. As we pointed out, to Tocqueville's family was personally targeted. In his cons cons uh, concern, the Tocqueville looked to America. So on the issue of how aristocrats would be treated them in his own country, he looked towards America to see how um, uh, democracy could be furthered, but also you could have the presence of these aristocratic families who um, you know, could exist within a society. Tyranny was centrally on the mind on the Frenchman's mind. In America, he saw a people who avoided it and, and who chose uh, and whose government reflected this. In the mind of, uh, in the mind, the government, in his mind, sorry, in his mind, the government was least threatening and the power of the people was strong. Okay? So, again, he had seen tyranny in France. I mean, the reign of terror, you cannot argue, uh, was tyranny. Now, whether or not what you thought led to that was a different story, but to Tocqueville has clearly laid out what that is, right? A, um, it's, you know, he's pointed out, as we talked about earlier in the podcast, you know, these destructive tendencies of the democracy in France, uh, a lust for equality, um, and pushing the aristocrats out, even though they could benefit the society in certain areas, okay? Um, even killing aristocrats. According to political commentator Mark Levin, de Tocqueville marveled at America's seemingly endless hurdles to that despotism. In addition to America's historical repudiation of and foundational limits on centralized governmental power um, manifested for the most part. In the official behavior of those holding federal office, the obstacles to democratic tyranny were a majority or faction of the populace, uh, where a majority or faction of the populace, population sorry, might seek to impose its will on the whole society operated a very difficult understanding. Oh, sorry, appeared a very difficult undertaking. De Tocqueville knew of tyranny because of his life in France and reflected that when he wrote, the, the vices which despotism produces are precisely those which equality fosters. These two things uh, perniciously can compete, um, complete sorry, and assist each other. Equality places men aside. Um, places equality places men side by side, unconnected by any common um, tie. Despotism raises barriers to keep them asunder. The former um, predisposes them not to consider their fellow creatures. The latter makes um, general indifference a sort of public virtue. So, in in the in the ideal of indis indifference. And Eli, Eli, Eli Vassal, he talks about um, that um, the opposite of love, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Um, be, and he was a, a Holocaust survivor. And so he, he said it wasn't the fact that you know, people were actively involved in, in these atrocities, the Holocaust, it was because they were indifferent to them. And he's, he's pointing this out here, too. He uses this sort of same logic. And is the former predis so uh, equality he's talking about the former predisposes them not to um, consider their fellow creatures, and the latter, which is despotism, the latter makes general indifference a sort of public virtue. So it, it makes it like good to be you know indifferent to things, and when people are indifferent to things, a lot of bad things can happen, right? And so he sees um, here he sees that uh, equality um, he felt could be used to establish despotism or tyranny. For uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, that was the lesson of the French Revolution. He also talked about who in um, hard, um, he talked about people in hard times would submit themselves to um, harder authority for help 
So if you don't know anything about the French Revolution, you know that, um, again, you can go to our um, French Revolution and Radical section. I don't know if I talk about it. I really did focus on the political element. But what I will tell you is there was a, a huge amount of hungry people. And, and so, like, you know that line that Maria Antoinette supposedly said when she said, let them eat cake, you know, making fun of the fact that they were hungry. Well, she never really said this. It was implied that she said this. But this made people angry because they were hungry, right? So this is what he's talking. He always he's always referencing France because that's where he comes from, and so he sort of takes and tries to learn from the society of France. Outward assistant, which he cannot expect from any of them, because they are all in, impotent and in, uh, unsympathizing. In his predicament, he naturally turns his eyes to that imposing power, which alone rises above the level of universal depression. Of that power, he his wants. And especially his desires continually remind him until he ultimately views it as the sole and necessary support of his own weakness. So the state, right? The state, they turn to the state. They turn to these, um, you know, um, so in this case, um, right, it's not so much about individuals helping individuals. Again, because in a free society, people aren't exactly asked to help other people. It's if they find it within their heart or the reason or their own personal um, Thing to help them, but it, there are times where people can become, um, where people will turn a blind eye to people who need help, and that is the nature of a free society. But see, people who are in desperate times will take desperate actions. Of that power, his wants and especially his desires continue to remind him until he ultimately views it as the sole and necessary support of his weakness. So the state, the all powerfulness of somebody. This may, uh, this may more completely explain what frequently takes place in democratic countries, where the very men who are, uh, are so impatient of, uh, impatient of superiors patiently, patiently submit to a, to a master exhibiting at once their pride and their civility. So civility servitude, to serve, right? So these are people that they get in desperate times and they're not really apt to submit to this all-powerful central authority. But th because they're desperate, they're willing to do that for um, perhaps a reward or perhaps somehow the state meeting their needs, right? And they become a servitude to it. People become desperate for help when they are, when are down and will submit to authority when options run out. So again, turn to the Fran French example. Um, they, there's people, you know, the, the, pe the people are hungry. Um, there's no really um, somebody ask you know helping them. They get very mad and frustrated. They take over the they throw over to the government and they put in place these people that are promising to help them. Okay, that's the direct connection to the French Revolution. Now whether or not the Tocqueville is directly talking about that, that's the historical background on what we're talking about. Um, conclusion: to Tocqueville uh, was critical of the revolution in France and destructiveness turned to America for answers. In America, he found a model he was more, uh, much more comfortable with. Knowing very well if democracy was coming to Europe, he laid out the model in America. Describing the reach of democracy in America, About.com wrote, the book was, and still remains, so popular because it deals with issues such as religion, the press, money, class structure, racism, the role of government and the judicial system, issues that are just as relevant today as they were then. A great deal of, of colleges in the U.S. use democracy in America in political science and history courses, and historians consider it one of the most comprehensive and insightful books ever written about the U.S. In fact, there is no more accurate description of the 1830s America from an outsider's perspective than de Tocqueville's work. For his part, de Tocqueville would also travel to England and Algeria, um, Algeria from 1841 to 1846, and he wrote works about these places that he traveled to, like, like he did in America. His works in America, England, and Algeria made him a pioneer of what eventually became the field of sociology, or more simply put, the study of society. Alexis de Tocqueville passed away in 1859, but his works long outlived his life. We study de Tocqueville because there is no work in which America life is written about. 
in such detail. So de Tocqueville wrote about America during this time, and there weren't a lot of people who were really taking a objective looks at society um, in America at the time. Um, he's objective because he comes from another country in that sense. Um, there weren't a lot of people who were looking at this society. There aren't even a lot of historians today that will tell you and look at American society during this period because we have, in history, we have two movements in between, two periods that historians find more important. I'll give you a second to catch up to my thought here. All of American history is, is, is put on a line, right? And it's all on the important periods. Well, there's two important periods that 1830s America falls in between, okay? Um, it's more of a footnote because there's so much more important things. And, you know, and maybe rightfully so because there is these two big things that happen. The Civil War, the most bloody conflict in the history of the United States, even dating all the way up into the present, and the American Revolution, the founding of the American nation in the United States. So when you're sandwiched between two big watershed moments, the American Revolution and the Civil War, 1830s America just becomes, it just doesn't seem as important. But there are important things that 1830s America um, establishes here, and that is um, how the issue of slavery does, is not decided in the, uh, by the Constitution and how it's going to be something that's going to eventually going to have to work out in the Civil War. See how that connects there. And then you also see the divide of two societies in America, which in 1830 is apparent to Tocqueville, which again is resolved in the Civil War. Um, and you can also see, and um, de Tocqueville's right, the legacy of the War of 1812. Um, how do we see that legacy? Well, there is a united American character. There is this spirit of liberty, and there is a, some sense of united identity. Um, you know, he writes about it. He talks about how the government is not as present. Um, you know, um, there's laws and all this stuff like that, but the government generally isn't something that's, you know, in your face in, in, in your daily life, and it's something he writes about, too. So anyway, for historians, we have pointed out at the end of this writing here, it says, and, and historians consider it one of the most comprehensive and insightful books ever written about the U.S., and that's saying something. So I think that's why it's important to study Alexis de Tocqueville, um, again, a, a great French thinker. So anyway, this is James signing off and saying, good luck.